For our final parallel session, we have the topic, how best to grapple with words and meanings in the OED. Now, one of the members of our panel has already uh, quibbled with me about the wording of even the heading for this session, so I think we're in for rather an exciting time. Um, we have three great speakers and a super respondent as well. First of all, we have Patrick Hanks, who's going to speak to us about words, contexts, and meanings. Um, Patrick, I think, by this point in the day, needs, needs, needs no introduction because you've all heard from him already, but he, he was uh, editor of the groundbreaking first edition of, of, of Collins Dictionary. Um, he was uh, deeply involved in the Oxford Dictionary of English, which has been mentioned many times today, and which many people confuse its title with the OED, but it's a very, very different work, and we're going to hear a lot about that from Patrick. And uh, he's worked since on um, many different approaches to computational approaches to uh, lexicography, and um, has strong interest in automatics as well, but that's not going to come into today's presentation. After him, we'll have uh, Wolfgang Klein on dictionaries and databases. Uh, Wolfgang comes from the uh, Max Planck Institute in Nijmegen, but has a lot of involvement with uh, electronic developments in dictionary making in Berlin, and particular interests in how corpora can be used in informing dictionary making and how readers can be made to be, to a certain extent, lexicographers themselves in compiling their own data from, from corpora. And finally, we'll have uh, Alan Kirkness, who was uh, one of the editors of the Deutsches Fremdwörter Buch, although um, he doesn't believe in Fremdwörter, and uh, is a great expert on the uh, history of historical lexicography and on its contemporary practice. And we're going to have um, three, um, I think, different approaches to um, some deeply related questions. Um, I thought I'd just pick up on a few themes that have come out of the newsletter contributions first, because it's quite a quite meaty topic this afternoon. Um, so I think we're going to be looking at what's the purpose of the definitions in a historical dictionary? Um, what do they bring that is distinct from the examples of use, and what's the relationship between the two? And then are there times where the examples speak more eloquently for themselves? I think that's something that uh, Ursula Lenka, as a respondent, wants to pick up. I didn't formally introduce Ursula Lenka, um, an eminent um, old English specialist and also specialist on the uh, history of English grammar and on uh, sentence adverbs, in particular in the history of English. And I know that she's very interested in some of the entries for large and complex verbs, for instance, in, in the OED. And she's going to maybe give us some, some challenging perspectives in her respondent role afterwards. Um, Patrick, I think, is probably going to push us a bit further and say um, more profoundly, can we always, or even can we ever, define words adequately in isolation? Or does meaning have more to do with how words interact with one another? Um, and then anticipating probably what's to come afterwards, is there a way for the dictionary definition to work in tandem uh, with the corpus search? And uh, can we signpost the way so that readers can explore things further for themselves, which I think will pick up some themes from this morning. What's the relationship between the tools you can use to analyze big data, the tools you can use to analyze corpora, and the dictionary entry? Can you integrate the two somehow in the same, the same interface? And then I think we'll be returning to the theme of how historical lexicography demands a widespread of expertise, um, which comes much better from a big team working in a coordinated way together than from any individual. Um, it isn't fast, it isn't easy, uh, but resources aren't infinite. We have to operate in, in particular, um, a, a particular world of financial constraints and so on. And readers rightly expect that coverage is broad and up to date and how you square that with the uh, demands of this intricate work is always difficult for historical lexicographers. How do we ensure that we keep getting the balance right? So, after that little paving of the way, I hope, I'm going to hand over to Patrick Hanks. I've got my slides there. They are there, and there's the clicker. Right. Well, the session, excuse me, Let's see what happens. The session is entitled, How Best to Grapple with Words and Meanings in OED, and I want to put in OED in brackets with a question mark. Philip has said a lot about historical dictionaries and definitions in historical dictionaries, about which I have little to say. Uh, my theme is, that, uh, is to, that, that the Oxford University Press ought to be persuaded to set up a synchronic OED um, on the basis or with a core on work already done by Judy Pearsall in the New Oxford Dictionary of English, now confusingly entitled the Oxford Dictionary of English, 
No doubt many people are surprised at the price when they ask for the Oxford English Dictionary, um, <laughs> or vice versa. Um, and, um, of course, the learner's dictionaries. Um, so I'm going to, and I'm going to argue that we need a completely new approach to words and word meaning. I'm, in fact, after a lifetime in lexicography, I have come to the conclusion that words don't have meaning. This is slightly alarming, but I rescue myself um, by claiming that words have meaning potential. Um, how is the potential realized? It's realized in context. How do we... Will any context do? No, we have to know what the conventional contexts are. Is there any reference work that tells you what the conventional contexts for each word are? No, there isn't. Um, so I do this with uh, this talk. I do this in a number of talks. If you try to think of the meaning of a word in isolation, um, Blow has uh, some 54 patterns of use um, which can be associated with meaning. So my idea is first find the pattern in the corpus and other data, then define the word in its conventional context, which is a pattern. Um, what's the meaning of fire? Uh, is it to discharge a bullet from a gun or is it to dismiss from employment? Well, of course, it's both uh, and a lot more as well. We all know this, uh, but words are hopelessly ambiguous. There are some things we don't know. And it's very difficult, very difficult, for users of a language to call word meanings to mind um, outside of any kind of context. I've just said all that. I'll move on. Um, so 25, in, one of the great things about counting patterns is you can uh, do a corpus analysis and you can assign each use in your sample to a pattern or you can say that it's an exploitation of a pattern or that it's unassignable, but we don't allow many unassignables. And then you can start counting. 25% uh, of all uses in our sample from the British National Corpus of the verb fire are people firing a firearm. Associ associated with that, there are a lot more patterns with people firing projectiles from a firearm. Um, uh, and those are distinguished from people firing other people. Uh, and you know what the meaning is because you're native speakers of English. Uh, but maybe a dictionary should just, sort of, for the sake of completeness, summarize what the meaning of all of those patterns are. And then firing up a machine, and we should note that there's an inchoative alternation. The machine fired up, um, but we don't say, um, we, don't, we, ne we cannot say Jonathan fired and mean he dismissed his employees. Um, we can have ideas firing people with enthusiasm. We can even have people in firing other people with enthusiasm. Where does it begin? Where does it end? We need to somehow sort this data and sort out the patterns of use. Not all possible uses, but all normal uses. Um, so, I've tried to evaluate the OED in this context because my question is, does the OED uh, answer some of the questions I've been asking uh, and I want to ask here? Does it tell us how English words are normally used? In my question this morning, I mentioned judges, lawyers, computational linguists, other people who want to know the contemporary meaning. No, it tells them that a camera is a small vaulted room and the treasury of the papal curia. It's quite some time before OED gets around to devices for record, recording images. Um, no, not a problem for native speakers, not a problem for the literati, uh, but a great problem for, for computers. 
Um, does the OED supply evidence to enable us to distinguish one sense of a word from another? No, it doesn't. Um, what you need for that is some sense of pattern, because patterns mostly are unambiguous. Words are multiply ambiguous. Um, does it tell us how conventional meanings and conventional uses have developed over time? No, it doesn't. Uh, the OED's first citation, I think it's the first citation for insight, is somebody inciting someone else to heroic deeds. Now, in my corpus, I find that you incite people to, to bad things or to doing bad things. Um, is that a recent development or was it already established in 1890 as a norm and is inciting people to heroic deeds and exploitation of what, even, what, what was a normal meaning even then? What's happening? Um, I'm going to... Now, Oxford University Press, in its wisdom on the OED website, has there's a nasty little button down in the right-hand corner that says, quick, quick and dirty current, it doesn't say dirty, uh, quick, quick current definition. There's a link to a current, quick current definition for most words in the OED. Uh, this is to the the Oxford Dictionary of English, not to be confused with the Oxford English Dictionary. And it says this sort of thing. Uh, it doesn't give you... It, it's, so this is, this is an attempt by Judy Pearsall and myself and uh, other colleagues in the 1990s and subsequently edited by Angus Stevenson and uh, Catherine Soans and others, um, an attempt to account for the contemporary meaning of words in English. This is a seed... We are, as far as, a as far as synchronic lexicography is concerned, we are in a pre-Johnsonian state. I'll move on. I just, this, is, this, this is monstrously unfair because this is the unrevised text of OED. I have no idea what properly means. Um, somebody later will probably tell us, sitting over there. And, um, um, no idea why it says the proper verb. Anyway, um, you get my point. So, um, and if I now give you the same sort of detail about, give you an example of, uh, for the verb blow, uh, similar to what I just gave you for the verb fire, uh, that we can see the main patterns are, I wonder if I dare try and, how do I get a little red thing? Right. We'll, the, we'll try experimenting here. Nothing. Ah, oh, ab uh, right. Okay. 16% of uses of blow in this corpus uh, are the wind blows with an adverbial of direction, an intransitive use. 8% are a wind or an explosion blowing something somewhere. 14% are a bomb or a, plosing, uh, or a person using explosives. So it's causative, uh, but also you can have ships blowing up. So there are two phrasal verb patterns uh, with up, um, and they contrast with people blowing up a balloon. And somehow we have to be able to take the corpus lines uh, that tell us about the distribution of contraceptives in India in the 1990s, uh, where the children blew up the contraceptives. The question is, uh, did they cause them to explode or were they treating them as balloons? Um, I want to say that that's an exploitation of the pattern, blow up a balloon. Uh, exploitation's quite important in what I'm saying. Okay, and then you, and so, so you go on. There are 14 idiom patterns, blow cobwebs a blow away, blow one's own trumpet, which is what I'm trying to do now, blow the whistle on, which is what uh, Philip will do very <laughs> shortly, um, 
blow one's brains out. That's what I'll do after Philip's finished with me. Uh, <laughs> blow hot and cold. Blow an activity, of course, off course. Blow a fuse, which has a different meaning if it's humans from uh, if it's an apparatus, um, and so on. So it's idiom rich. We need to relate the idioms to patterns, but we, at least we need to state what the idioms are and what they mean. Uh, dictionaries do a sort of, they have a sort of wonderful random shot, scatter shot technique in dealing with them. Uh, the OED has a magnificent list of completely obsolete idioms with, uh, with various senses of blow. I had, a, I had about 15 slides taken from the OED, and I've thrown them all out because time doesn't allow. And I want to now move on very quickly. Firstly, I want to, I, the, I want to introduce H.P. Grice here. Grice argues that, there, that meanings are events, or at least he implies that meanings are events rather than static objects. Um, they're events that are interactions between people and places and they rely on a shared body of linguistic conventions. But of course, being a philosopher, he doesn't tell us what that shared body of linguistic conventions is. He just uh, gives an airy wave of the hand and says there must be one. Um, the job of lexicographers and grammarians, in my opinion, is, is to make them explicit in a thoroughly boring way, as boring as possible. Um, uh, it hasn't, they're not the meanings as stated in dictionaries. Among the evidence that dictionaries don't do this job, um, no dictionaries do this job, is the fact that uh, two decades of research in word sense disambiguation is now declared a failure by its principal practitioners. Um, I'm going to skip on... Uh, I'm just going to say that it, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to say that, uh, that traditionally all our dictionaries, including current ones, including dictionaries of current English and including the OED, uh, tend, to, tend to, to veer towards the assumption that um, the meaning of a term uh, is, a member, is a matter of set membership and set membership is determined by necessary and sufficient conditions. If it has a trunk, it must, have, uh, must be an elephant, and if it's an elephant, it must have a trunk. That's the sort of thinking that goes on. I'm going to come back to that, so I'm going to, I must move on quickly because I've got important points at the end about that issue. Um, this quote is a huge challenge uh, to the OED and to other lexicographers. Some aspects of textual meaning arise from... Oh, this is not the quote. Uh, some aspects of textual meaning arise from particular com combinations of choices. Let me move on and see if... Where is he? Where is he? Yes. This is the one I was after. Many, if not most, meanings depend on the presence of more than one word for their realization. If Sinclair is right, and I think he is when you start looking at a corpus, uh, then the lexicographical enterprise of tacking meanings onto words in isolation is doomed. Um, oh, I wanted to have a passing shot at Riddle. You know about Riddle. Uh, I talk about riddle often. I think riddle should, riddle noun for should not be in OED. You should go through, gentlemen, and t ch at least challenge uh, all the nonce words because there's no shared body of convention that supports the notion that riddle means a hole made by a, a bullet. And when you come to think of it, my mother had dropped a tear, my mother had dropped a tear over the riddle of a bullet in the flap is equally compatible with the interpretation uh, an enigma or conundrum, or it might be just a mistake. Um, so 
nonce words. And John Simpson and I had a lively conversation, uh, a correspondence 15 years about, ago about Finnegan's Wake, in which he said it is not part of the program of OED to include the entire vocabulary of Finnegan's Wake. Thank God for that. Uh, um, OK, so we have various kinds of regular and irregular linguistic performance, which it is the job of the lexicographer to describe. Um, I've got all sorts of lovely quotes here, which I haven't got time to read out to you, um, but the slides are around somewhere. Um, so the implications are that meanings are associated with words in prototypical phraseological patterns. If we did the synchronic OED on the principles that I'm suggesting, we could then project it backwards and do a synchronic OED for 1890 and 1790 and 1690. Um, and we could see why it is that on the walls of Ex Exeter, oh my god, uh, I didn't see five minutes. Uh, why on the walls of Exeter Cathedral there's an inscription praising a bishop of Exeter for being an opponent of enthusiasm, a constant opponent of enthusiasm, and, who, and that he endeared himself to his clergy by his condescension. Those were normal in those days. Uh, there's a quote. Okay, I have all sorts of quotes here on how not to define words. Do not say um, that a wolf is a member of the species from which domestic dogs evolved in the, in the Mesolithic period. Do not define dogs as a member of the species Canis familiaris or spiders as members of the order Arachnidae. Say instead, where you can read all this, that dogs were probably domesticated from wolves. There are many different breeds of dogs, what they're kept for, what they do. They bark, whine, growl, yap, howl. They wag their tails when they're pleased. This is the sort of information that, that summarizes the conventions that we rely on in order to communicate one another, not canis familiaris. Um, I'm going to have to stop. Oh, here is, yes, I've, I've reached the end. You can read, read the conclusions. Thank you, Philip. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, the, the slides will all be archived, so you will have time to read all of this at leisure. Um, as a little bonus, actually, you have o OED's, uh, the beginning of OED's revised entry for DOG somewhere in the papers on your table, and you'll see we're not so far apart, actually, interestingly, <laughs> um, which I find very encouraging, but I'm going to sit down now and probably have to walk in line by this presentation. As long as it doesn't count in on my time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's all. No, no, I don't need anything. Um, I think 15 minutes can be a very long time when you're sitting in a dentist chair, uh, but it's definitely a very short time when you ha have to explain your views on how to grapple best, I don't know how best to grapple um, meanings and words in a dictionary. I'm um, uh, not a professional lexicographer, I'm a general linguist, but it so happened that I'm now responsible for the dictionary project in the Berlin Academy. Um, and this has taught me something. Uh, for example, a different way of thinking about meanings. As a linguist, you, are, you, have, a, you have a special notion. A couple of years ago, um, I was interested in the semantic and also syntactic properties of a small class of German words and the interaction of semantic and syntactic properties. And I did, since it was about uh, lexical semantics, I did what I think every reasonable linguist should do. I inspected what dictionaries have to say about that, uh, the best German dictionaries that was in German. And, um, well, to characterize my, uh, my, the result, I was not entirely happy. Um, one idea was simply that I thought the description of the definition of the lexical meaning should be so precise and specific that it singles out the word in question from all other words in that particular language. So that by the very definition, someone who knows the language, I'm, I'm not talking very exotic words, so common words, so just uh, um, by, by the definition, you should be able to say what word is targeted at. Now, I will do this little exercise with you now with three English words. The first one is this. That's the definition from the OED. Before the time in question, beforehand, by now, as early, or as soon as this. Already. Mm -hmm. Can you read it again? Yep. 
before the time, in, now it's easy, no? mm -hmm. uh, before the time in question beforehand, by now, as early, or as soon as this. Okay, next one. Without change, interruption, or cessation, continually, constantly, on every occasion, invariably, always. Do you know anyone? Should I read it again? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, this, I mean, uh, kind of 30 seconds extra, yeah. <laughs> without, <laughs> without change, interruption, or cessation, continually, constantly, on every occasion, <coughs> invariably, always. No? Permanent. It would be funny to define always by always. It happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's still. In, in the temporal meaning. In the temporal meaning, I should say, in all fairness. By the way, all of these words have other readings. I mean, I'm really talking about the most common ones. Now, example three here, I give two readings or two senses. Um, a, implying continuance from a previous time up uh, to and at the present or some stated time. Now, as until now, or then, as until then. B, referring to the period preceding the present or some stated time without necessarily implying continuance. Up to this or that time, till now, or till then, hitherto, thus far. Yeah. Who? Huh? Yeah. No, it's yet. Mm -hmm. Yet someone said yet here. Yeah, I mean, bravo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, this was just a little exercise. Now, there are several things I think which are missing here from this lexical description, which are actually fairly obvious when you work as a linguist about these words. For example, um, obviously they form a little system together with some other words, by the way, form a little system. So as you easily see when you compare. Uh, he was still here, and he was already here. Somehow, I mean, there's a kind of symmetry or correspondence or so, which I think is not matched at all uh, in these descriptions, in these definitions here. A second point is this. There are some obvious oddities with these words when you put them into context, and they must come from the lexical meaning of those words. So just to give a simple example, you can easily say he was already dead, but you can't say, oh well, it's odd to say he was still dead. Jesus Christ was still dead um, at the second day uh, here, but normally you can't say that. But it has nothing just to do with dead. I mean, there are other examples where you also get odd uh, um, consequences. For example, if you say he was still not here, that's absolutely fine, but if you say he was already not here, well, it is possible. Uh, there might be context, but somehow it's odd. And the crucial point here I want to make is really these must be semantic properties of these words. So it be they belong to the meaning, or to the lexical meaning of these words. Okay. Now, I did not come here in order to criticize the OED. Actually, I mean, when I looked all of this up, I had a wonderful weekend uh, here, and uh, just by browsing through all of this, it happened what happens, I think, to many people. I went on and on. I'm taking an extra 30 seconds for praise of OED. You know? <laughs> <laughs> So the feeling, the feelings which I had uh, this weekend can be described um, by two words which are defined as follows. Regard for someone or something considered praiseworthy or excellent, esteem, approbation, appreciation, also a feeling or expression of this, admiration. Mm -hmm. The second one is diversion, amusement, sport, also boisterous jocularity or gaiety, drollery, also a source of course, or amusement or pleasure. Fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so really spend a full weekend with amusement and fun and also I must say a kind of jealousy because I'm in charge of another dictionary and this is just wonderful in spite of the uh, points I just raised here. Now, if the best dictionary in the world apparently does not really cover some obvious lexical properties uh, of some very common English words here, what conclusion should be drawn from that? I mean, there are two possible conclusions. One of them is there's something wrong with the OED, and it's not just in this context that they say this is not true, uh, or it's something wrong with my conception of what a, word, a dictionary should do with a description of lexical meaning. So, and the reason 
Um, why I think I was wrong is not a particular kind of modesty, which, I mean, is far from me. Um, it's just the experience I have made with the Berlin Dictionary, where, I mean, we have to describe in the new version which we are planning, something like that's because that's now corpora, there's something like five million different lemmata, five million. I mean, this has to do with the fact that German has these incredible uh, possibilities for word formation. Now, you might say immediately all of these are compounds, and so, no, no, that's an illusion. Mm -hmm. Most of them are compounds, but you can't derive the actual sense in which they're used so easily from, from the meaning or the senses of their parts here. But that's a separate issue about which I won't talk here. So it's just a gigantic task here. So and that brought me to the view that actually the description of meaning, lexical meaning, in a way for the dictionary maker is a kind of derived task. It comes from, the, from something like underlying tasks. And the main, not the only task here, is just something which you all experience uh, when you ever, whenever you try to look up a dictionary, in, at least in most cases here, because you do it because you don't understand something, a sentence, a whole text or so, and the reason is it has to do with one or two words in it about whose mean you have no idea what it means at all, or you're not sure about the meaning, or it has another reading, like Riddle, for example, in this particular case or so uh, here. So what I think, and I will try to generalize this a little bit, is just the task of the lexicographer in uh, developing definitions is just to help the reader, the main task, is to help the reader to understand a text, to understand a text in which that word occurs. I do not say to understand that word, because this has a little bit to do with uh, what Patrick just said here. What you really have to do is you understand the text, and the meaning of that word, the lexical meaning, contributes to such an understanding. And I think this is actually well served by the definitions you have given here in the OED for these three words. Oh, I mean, well served, yeah, okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, so, and in that sense, it really does it function. So, we should. Consider the task how best to grapple with meanings and words just against this task here. Does it help the reader? For example, if you have a perfect description in very cryptic predicate logic language, it doesn't help very many readers. There might be specialized readers for whom this is exactly true. Now, that, however, also means that there is not just one ideal meaning description because this depends on A, the type of texts you have in mind, B, the type of readers, and C, the amount of help which you are allowed or are possible, which is possible for you to give. So you must be highly variable in that. Now, um, uh, let me briefly, very briefly, how much time do I have? Okay, good. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, let me very briefly illustrate this with two or three examples. Um, like, as I see Brian here, I mean, a lawyer um, needs a very precise definition in very many cases of either a term or even of some other lexical item. I've had, I once had a project on the understandability of legal texts here, and I've noticed that even modal verbs are terribly important, so must and should, there's a very clear difference. So in that case, you need a very precise definition here. On the other extreme, we have someone like, for example, um, someone who knows English very well, so it's a Japanese person who translates literally text in, into Japanese from English. He knows English very well, but there is this word which he or she doesn't understand at all. In such a case, it's probably completely superfluous uh, for that person to even try a definition, just give him or her 10 examples, uh, understandable examples from some corpus, and then this person will understand. Or third example, a learner, a student, again, would need a kind of different, I mean, need just a kind of guidance uh, here in order to learn it. Uh, just from the examples here. And finally, we could also talk about linguists. I mean, I said I was not entirely happy with the meaning descriptions I found in these German dictionaries. Still, I did, not, I did not say, I mean, they weren't helpful. They were helpful in many respects because I found wonderful examples, uh, so which really helped me uh, to understand exactly what was going on with the lexical, uh, with the se uh, semantical and, and syntactical properties here. So, depending on the type of text and the type of readers and the amount of help, the task must be very different, judged in a very, done in a very different way, and judged actually from a different point of view. Now, um, I have to cut down here a little bit. Uh, here, um, I mean, actually, my talk is called um, Dictionaries and Databases. Did I give that title? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, I mean, I will now talk a little bit about databases and what the advent uh, of a huge digital corpus, which we use a lot in the Berlin project, uh, what, what, uh, um, which consequences this has. Now, I could phrase it initially um, in terms of four major constraints which all lexicographers are facing. One of them 
constraints of space, of time, of funding, an important factor, yeah? And finally, of methods. I mean, methods means, for example, do we really use, need definitions, paraphrases, in order to define meanings? So some of these have clearly changed due to the advent of huge digital corpora. For example, space is no longer a problem. Um, here, time still is. It might be that it speeds up the process in some respects, digital tools, not so very much the corpora, uh, but I'm, I'm not totally sure how much, to much extent. Funding, I don't think that it makes any difference here. Methods, I think we have a couple of new methods here, and I'm not, I was optimistic, but I'm a little bit less optimistic than I was two or three years ago, how much this really can be used for the purpose of dictionary making in order to describe meanings here. I mean, beyond the classical paraphrase method, defining a definition method here. Now, these are four factors which one, I mean, one could give a talk about each of those, but I will just highlight two other aspects. One of them is the advent of digital methods and corpora uh, has first of all provided us with gigantic additional sources of lexical information. Now, is this good or bad? It is good in many ways because we have much more resources now. But sometimes I feel it's a little bit like a person, a lexicographer is a little bit in the situation of a person who asks for a bit of water and finds himself then thrown into a swimming pool. Uh, and you just, I mean, don't know, don't know what to do uh, with all of this here. So, and new problems arise here. And for example, that we now have five million, maybe four million uh, German words to describe or so, illustrates the problem. I think in English you get exactly the same, maybe not the same figures, but exactly the same problem. And we must invent new methods, I mean, how to deal with that in a satisfactory way. The other, uh, 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 the other thing which, which uh, we, we gained uh, from, from these digital methods is just flexibility. Flexibility in many respects. Uh, it was mentioned in, in the earlier meeting here, so that it freed us from the alphabetic order. And there are many other things of that sort, or the need to wait for the next edition. I mean, you can immediately update it. So in one respect, flexibility. But there's another type of flexibility which I believe we now can really use, and this is the depth and type uh, of uh, meaning descriptions. The way in which we describe meanings can be held very flexible. We can do it for the lawyer, for example, or someone who's interested in historical data who wants to read Milton uh, and see, I mean, how word evolved and how it changed. And we can also do it for the learner and so on and so forth. So in that sense, we, can, we, can, we are now in a position to become entirely flexible. Well, what we are trying in, in the Berlin project now in this uh, Digitale Wörterbuch der Deutschen Sprache, whose technical underpinning are no, no, no more already, um, is we trying to do that exactly that. So this deviates in a lot of respects from a classical dictionary, and the idea is just that you have a kind of window and panel construction in which various resources can be changed and addressed uh, by the users in such a way that to, for a great deal of these windows, it is actually the task is actually a little bit shifted to the user. Remember, I mean, I said what is crucial for the lexicographer is provide help to the reader uh, when he wants to understand uh, a text here. So, and then if a reader wants that, I think you, I mean, it's possible to tell him, I mean, you have to look up certain things. I gave the example of the translator. I mean, if I give you 10 examples from exactly the same type of text, that should be enough uh, for that person, at least for a while. Whereas if I'm working for a lawyer, I really need a precise definition. And for a historian, again and again. So with that method, actually, that all of a sudden becomes possible. And here I have to end. Hmm. Now hand over to Alan Kirkness. Um, my topic is the human element in terms of historical lexicography. Let me start with a few generalities, and they will be banalities, and then move on to the specifics or to the detail. Because I think if there's a field in which the devil is lurking, it's in the detail, it is lexicography. And a good dictionary gets a lot of detail right. Obviously, it's humans who use historical dictionaries, a la OED. There are different user groups, and they've been named today. One is so-called readers. And by readers, I don't just mean people who happen stance on the dictionary, but people who read for the dictionary, who also read the dictionary. 
and we've heard a lot about big data and about computer reading programs. I think there's a difference of degree and of kind between the reading programs that the OED still does, and there are four main ones, and computer reading. A reading by a human always involves interpretation. There is a filter and there's a semantic filter. I doubt that this is true of computer texts with huge numbers. Uh, the big data people will correct me, but whether there's semantic interpretation of data when you're reading through the computer, I wonder. Question. Scholars, and one of the types of scholars that use uh, the OED most are scholars in other languages and etymologists and lexicographers of other languages. Then there's the wider public uh, who also use the dictionary in different ways. And one of the features of the OED that strikes me is the huge interaction between different user groups and the dictionary staff. And in my experience, the degree of interaction is pretty unusual and very innovative. And when we come to this interaction, obviously the human element is paramount. Um, I want to go on to one form of interaction between the dictionary staff and the main the editorial staff, dictionary editors, and another group, and that is the computer specialists or the software programmers. Uh, the OED features a lot of very sophisticated uh, technological programming. So you've got the hype, uh, hype, what do you call them? The hypertext cross-references, notably to the uh, thesaurus, but also to other entries and so on, where you can follow all sorts of links within the dictionary itself. You can also go outside the dictionary to the Oxford Dictionary of Interest, e English, if you're looking for uh, a quick definition quote. Uh, one of the particular technological innovations in the dictionary that interests me personally are the so-called timelines. I think these are brilliant in the sense that if I want to look up, for example, words from post-classical Latin, I can do this. I can also itemize them according to half centuries, and then I can get a list of the words in that half century that have come from post-classical Latin, and I can arrange them chronologically or alphabetically. So in terms of a research tool, this is marvelous. But it depends on what the editors have put in, and then the means of access and availability that have been made digitally or technologically. So there is a real interplay between technology and editorial work here, which I find uh, pretty sophisticated. But let me move on to a particular problem that's come up today many, many times, and that is the interaction between the editors and the corpus specialists. And I do not dispute the influence or use of corpora in any way, but I think there are aspects of a historical dictionary which do not benefit from huge corpora, and I want to explain a couple of those. In terms of detail, can you go back up to the top? A couple of concrete examples to make it clearer. One is the word cell. And if you follow the etymology of the word cell, and if you could scroll down, you'll find that it is highly polysemous. And one of the interesting thing is that different meanings can keep, here you've got huge range of European languages, mainly Latin. If you scroll down, you can see in individual senses, it's come from French, cellule, or cell. It has come from Latin. It's been mediated through German, etc. Now, these different senses, you will not get out of a corpus. There's, the human element is paramount here. And they're also used, in terms of etymology, is used for lumping or splitting, so that different senses in a polysemous item may depend on the etymology, and that is not something that you'll find in a corpus, unless you're lucky. There may be a specific reference. I have coined this word in this sense at this time. But even that can be misleading. So one example where I think we're going to go beyond corpora to the human element, to the editorial element, is in etymologies, hair cell, and it's an example I've pinched from John Simpson. He mentions this in one of his pieces. It's polysemous, and the etymology, different languages, plays a huge role. Let me move on to another one, because I mentioned the fact that you might be lucky and find a specific reference to a coining of an item, and this is alcoholism. Uh, 
and this is an interesting entry. It's very different from OED2, and OED3 is quite different. And this would be a suggestion. Uh, perhaps the timelines could be distinguished between OE3, OED3 and OED3 plus 2, because the revision, especially in the etymologies, is major. And if I'm looking for, for example, categories, then I might want to restrict them to the revised entries in OED3 rather than have OED3 mixed up with OED2. I wonder if this can be filtered out so that I can choose between the two. With alcoholism, the standard view was that there was a Swedish physician, Hus, who coined the phrase in 1849, and the phrase alcoholismus chronicus was then mediated European-wide through a German translation. So you've got a difficulty here, Swedish, not known, and then mediated through a German version. And this is interesting. If you come down here, we find that, in fact, English has found an attestation earlier. So going back up, we find 1848 was the first English usage, and then further up in the etymology, compare the following instance of scientific Latin, noun from a German translation of Husserl's work, and there it is given quite separately. In OED 2, for example, you will find that this particular quote from Huss is the first citation given under the entry English alcoholism, which is obviously an error that's been corrected. Further up, we're told that alcoholism in English is a derivative. It's a suffixation of the noun alcohol plus the English suffix ism. I wonder. In terms of the material here, 1848, before Huss, before the German translation, yes. But then if you look a little bit further, and here I'm picking up on my point that lexicographers of one particular language need to use dictionaries or consultants or etymologists of other languages, if you go to the Trésor de la Langue Française, they are busy in Nancy revising their etymologies. And one of the revised etymologies concerns the word alcoholism. And there you will find, it's interesting, the description is it's a linguistic transfer and it's taken from a calc of scientific Latin. But the French people give you a, a citation from 1843, so predating the scientific Latin, predating the English, and it's from a German source. So the question now becomes, in French, perhaps it should be a calc on German alcoholismus, because it's earlier. In English, you have to ask whether, in fact, the etymology is, in fact, a borrowing from German. To do that, you would have to establish that there was some connection between the first English uses and the German original. That's very difficult, uh, and so on. The scientific Latin comes later. So it is, in fact, not deemed from scientific Latin. It may have come from German via French, via Latin, or whatever. So here, I think, is where I have large corpora, big data, don't help in terms of the etymology. And I believe that there is always a connection between the etymology and the meaning and the senses of the word. This is much more clear with cell, where you have a polysemous item. And the different etymologies make a huge difference, A, to your description of the word in terms of lumping or splitting, also in terms of uh, the meanings that those particular items have, whether they've been borrowed from a particular language or not. So, yes, big data, as big as you like, but I think there are essential elements in a historical dictionary, etymology, and I understand etymology in the sense of origin and history of words, including their senses, where big data, I don't think, help. It is the human element, it's the editorial process, working on text, interpreting texts, that makes the difference. So for me, the human element is paramount, and I pick up on what John said earlier today, it is editorial integrity that has to be preserved. Thank you. I'd like, now like to hand over to Ursula Lenka, who's going to respond and lead us into general discussion. Um, I'd like to follow up on this idea of the human element here, and I actually think there are three uh, um, 
more than one human element, which is important. I think uh, we've heard a lot about that data is infinite and space is infinite, uh, but unluckily, my time isn't infinite. And uh, for what I access the dictionary to is that I kind of save time and I have an easy and quick access to work which has been done for me already. And so I really, I think I'd like to follow up on what, on what you uh, said before is that I rely on editorial ambition and, and, and editorial competence and editorial standards uh, kind of to do that work for me. Uh, if, I'm, uh, if everything which has been mentioned today uh, were also found in, in the OED entries, I mean, I would have to start again with my work, which I often do as a linguist. And for many of the things I've heard today, I almost felt that I'm going to be unemployed as a linguist because everything will be in the OED anyway. So, um, and if I think of how, many, how much time I've spent on just working on 15 adverbial connectors or so in the history of English, and that has, that has been four years for, for the history of, of English, I think, well, this is just not uh, uh, viable to uh, do that. So, uh, in my um, idea, uh, it is important, uh, first of all, that it's uh, competent, as I say, and reliable uh, information I get, and as that it's probably not expansion so much, but to a certain degree also restriction, uh, that it's e more easily accessible. Um, in um, uh, my uh, report to the news uh, letter, I said it's probably uh, quoting on, on the meaning of everything by Simon Winchester, I said it's probably not every meaning of everything which should be uh, uh, mentioned or recorded as subsenses uh, here. And I've given an example of one of the period dictionaries where you have Old English Flotarian of St. Vincent's body. So this is typically an example of a contextualized meaning floating uh, of a body. And you don't. You know. You do not need a substance for that, even for the older uh, stages of that. But uh, this brings me to what is the task of the uh, lexicographer here? And I uh, obviously rely on all this big data that it is exploited here, and I mean that you use it uh, here as you uh, use the crowdsourcing of the readers uh, beforehand. But many, uh, much of it depends obviously on the presentation and on the visual. Um, as we've heard today uh, of uh, these things. And we've heard that people love to see graphs about language charts and diagrams. And uh, Mark Alexander in another thing has told us, uh, has said how many, for example, for the etymology you just mentioned, that you can do color codes, for example, in a certain semantic field, saying in this semantic field that you have uh, green dots for uh, Germanic words and red dot for Romans words and so on and so on. And you can have all uh, kinds of charts and, and diagrams. What I really found interesting in uh, this panel here is I think that there is an understanding that we cannot see words in isolation. And if you cannot see words, words in isolation, I think one of the uh, acids of the OED has always been from its very beginning that you have the quotations. And I give uh, an example uh, in the newsletter thing that quotations can often be much, can tell you much more about the senses uh, than the actual sense description does. Uh, so uh, I'm not fully aware of how the quotations are picked, but if we go into semantic research um, just uh, now and we have a look into words which are high frequent, there's a differentiation between coded meaning and contextualized meaning. And so what you could, for example, do, or that would be one of the suggestions, is that contextualized meaning uh, is as has been shown here in patterns, that you give the patterns, for example, uh, and restrict it to certain uh, levels. And this is much closer to how we acquire uh, our native language. Uh, we have a look into uh, different patterns seeing there, and then we, from, from there on, understand uh, uh, the, the senses uh, uh, much more than that. And perhaps uh, to give an example, as Philip uh, said that, from uh, the uh, motion verbs, for example, 
example, there are examples of saying he sneezed out of the window, uh, of, of the room, or he coughed out of the room. So if there were a link, more or less, to the pattern, he went out of the room, and you could then have kind of these patterns for all the motion verbs, and then you could interlink them, and so you had this contextualization uh, in the context of the intransitive motion construction, but perhaps also uh, a more historical factor uh, about what has changed, how many words have entered into the motion construction uh, or not. So my idea basically is that the uh, information uh, in the OED, I think, uh, as, as I've said before, uh, the patterns, I think, could be, if, if they made clear what they are, uh, could be presented uh, probably in a more easy, accessible way, and then uh, the information in the OED by experts is bought, and bought here is in, to, in both of the senses of bought here. Okay. Thank you very much, Ursula. So do we have the microphone ready? And I'd like to open up the floor for questions, discussion, general debate. First question here, Guo Pa Chen. Uh, I'd like to make some comments on uh, Patrick's um, questions. Uh, two comments mainly. First, I believe words do have meanings, but different types of words have different types of meanings. Some words, like technical terms, have only meanings. For example, larynx. There's no other meaning, just one meaning. No matter where it is used, Good there's point. only one meaning. Okay. Other words, which, are, uh, which have uh, both prototypical meaning or first meaning and the metaphorical meaning. These words have meanings and meaning potentials. Third, grammatical words. Many of them have only meaning potentials, no real meaning, because uh, their initial meaning may have been lost. We do not know what their initial meanings are. This is my uh, first comment. Uh, uh, let me use one example. Um, Recently, I'm, I'm writing an article about uh, uh, the uh, uh, throat, uh, pharynx, and the larynx. <coughs> I, I, I use the OED quite a lot. And I, I'd like here to uh, quote the OED's definition, because uh, I compared the Wikipedia's def definition and OED2 and OED3. Uh, Wikipedia uh, contains 65 words. I'm not going to read it. Okay. Now, I'm going to read OED2's definition. The cavity with its enclosing muscles and uh, mucous membrane situated behind and communicating with the nose, mouth, and the larynx, and continues below with the esophagus, forming a passage from the mouth to the foot and drink, and from the nasal passages for the breath. 44 words, much fewer than the Wikipedia, but OED3. The cavity between the mouth and esophagus lined by a mucous membrane and enclosed by muscles and communicating also with the nasal cavity, eustachian tubes and larynx, 28 words. And I think the OED3 definition is excellent, except the word eustachian. I think uh, a more common word can be used. Okay. Now, again, uh, OED3 gives another definition, uh, definition two. Uh, in OED2, uh, it's A and B. In OED3, it's one and two. Definition two, uh, in, in vertebrates, the part of the alimentary canal immediately posterior to the buccal, uh, buccal cavity. Okay. Now, this actually doesn't have a different meaning. It's only uh, the use of the word in application to some other type of animals. Uh, uh, the function is the same, but structure may be a little different. Now, most of the words that have multiple meanings are like this, but the, the metaphorical use is uh, across another, uh, to, to another genre. For example, the word run. Uh, if animals or humans, any animals which have feet can run. This is the prototypical meaning. Uh, uh, things that do not have feet may also run but like water and the thought and so on, but they are uh, uh, different collocations. The different meanings come from different collocations. This is one point I would like to make. The second point is about 
the necessity of a synchron synchronic dictionary. I think a synchronic dictionary is only theoretically viable if a language has no history or no historical change, like the new, a new language which is recently invented by a group of children in Australia. You see, uh, there's no historical evolution. Any language, like English or Chinese, no matter which name, uh, uh, which name a dictionary uh, assumes, like uh, in China there is a dictionary of uh, a contemporary a, uh, a diction of contemporary Chinese, but if you look up this dictionary, it's full of uh, historical information about, about words. So for any language that has history, a synchronic dictionary is impossible. Uh, what we need is a more up-to-date version of the OED. If, if every entry is rewritten like the OED 3, and uh, if all the uh, uh, current meanings are added, then we, there's no need for a so-called synchronic dictionary, and the dictionary, the Oxford Dictionary of the English Language, would, would not be of uh, any use. <laughs> Tour de force. Would you like to respond? Before? No, no, I, I, no, I, I, I think there's a lot in what he says, and I think we need to make a, a distinction between. Um, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think we need to make a distinction between terminology and uh, ordinary English words. And for, time, for reasons of time constraints, I was being deliberately provocative to those who believe that words have meanings. Thank you for that elaboration and elucidation. Could I, could I just, just comment on one aspect? Uh, I, often these descriptions uh, of certain objects or so sound very ridiculous to us. But I've recently tried to explain to students what a microfiche reading uh, um, machine was. Uh, and because they don't know it any longer. And I mean, uh, if you... you it, it, would be, it would have been really essential if I had had the vocabulary to tell them what, it, what exactly it was. So uh, sometimes they are astrologers in, in, for Middle English. So what exactly is this machine? What does it do? So you need to be specific in a certain way. For, for us, some of these um, uh, meaning descriptions now seem ridiculous, you know, but if you go, if you really think of the future of the OED, it's perhaps essential that uh, many of the things which we now take for granted what it, what it is uh, are in the dictionary because uh, some, I mean, the microfiche is just a thing which has, or, or, or a tape recorder. Uh, what is it exactly if you read all the texts? Uh, so uh, just to, to promise. Uh, as a couple of people have commented in coffee breaks that may not have come, come across in sessions, history goes on in the present as well. And that's yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Jeffrey Triggs. I, I just hope it, that we don't get the impression that the OED entries were written in isolation of any context, that the meanings, the people are reading, the readers and then the, the editors are always reading quotes with considerable context and, and in a way doing on a human scale what Patrick's talking about doing you know, through a machine, isolating them and, and saying, not that you can't use a corpora. Uh, oh, they, that's good. No, 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 they, they're certainly helpful and perhaps Historical corpora that, that, that we're beginning to we're beginning to see now will be will be useful, uh, but it doesn't take the, the place of the citation files to uh, help. And and certainly the definition is based on that. I'd like to see maybe playing with the entries. You know, if you're, I know you're worried about seeing obsolete entries first. You could you know you can reverse the order based on on some kind of uh, outside you know accounts or you know reverse the order of the quotations so you can. You can start seeing the, the modern ones you know, first, but it's, uh, you know, there's all kinds of play with different views, but, but the, the essential thing, I think, is, is um, stable and, and, and valid uh, still, the essential you know, approach to the OED for, you know, for a historical dictionary as a use. Yeah. Um, there's a good reason you. to keep Odell around. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I have to disagree with you. The first thing to say um, is... It wouldn't be the first time, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, nor the last, I hope. Um, the first thing to say is that I think there is a 
distinction needs to be made between cognitive salience and social salience. salience social salience is frequency, cognitive salience is recallability. Um, in the strong version of this theory, they are in an inverse relationship. You only remember what is, seems unusual. You don't remember the ordinary everyday uses of words. Um, and even in the weak version, they're just independent variables. Either way, it's really important to have a very large body of evidence that shows you um, how the word is normally and ordinarily used and that the OED editors did not have because the entire reading program, I mean, Murray, Murray the entire reading program tends to focus on, tended to focus on collecting uh, interesting words. It would be an insane citation reader who, when given a book to read, copied out all occurrences of the word of. Um, and Murray himself noticed this. Very early on, in a famous quotation, he said that, uh, they, that in the slips he found 50 citations for abusion, but for abuse and abuse, not five. Uh, so the editor and his staff had to spend time, precious hours, searching for uses of common everyday words. So I think the corpus, what I'm talking about is common everyday words, um, and, yeah, I'll stop there. We don't necessarily know about the fre uh, comparative frequency of abuse and abusion in the past, of course. No. Mm -hmm. and to some extent, we never will. Yeah. Yeah. A lot depends on what gets... You can, you can be pretty sure that abusion was less frequent than... No, you... No. no well, you're, I'd you're like some this. empirical data, but... <laughs> so, but there isn't any, is yeah. there? But that's where we're moving. Yes, at the very, at the very back, uh, Eric from Benin. So, so I was actually a little, uh, a little disappointed that you that you backed off on this notion that you know a word has meaning potential, uh, and that no word actually has a specific meaning. Uh, I don't know. I did a little. Googling, and I was uh, able to find, for instance, uh, velvet larynx, iron larynx, leathery larynx, uh, and all other, all kinds of other examples that uh, you could have used to support the view that I thought you so eloquently larynx, um, and which I think is correct. You know, I think it's a general problem that dictionaries face, and that and that we ought to think about because it highlights the extent to which a definition is can only do part of the work. Uh, and we have to be able to rely on other sorts of things. We have to be able to rely on getting people into a network of examples if they're going to really uh, understand what's relevant. Like, particular, for instance, in historical cases, if you're doing manuscript work or you're thinking about, uh, for instance, biblical hapax legomena, the crucial thing, uh, the most helpful thing in many cases is not a definition because you know that whoever produced that definition is speculating the same way that you are. What you really want is, here are all of the relevant examples. Here are all of the forms uh, vaguely related to this word. We're presenting them all to you. We think it might mean this, but come to your own conclusions. I'm in danger of monopolizing this, but can I just say one word? Um, that uh, I didn't really make the case properly about terminology versus words. Ooh. Terminology is defined in terms of ordinary words, but terms... We live, in a, we, we live in a universe which is theory-ridden, uh, and we express many of our theories in technical terms. And larynx is both a technical term, but thank you for demonstrating that it can be exploited in interesting and indeed novel ways, just, like, just, like an or, just as if it was an ordinary word. We probably have time for a couple more comments. Philip? Yes, uh, I don't accept the dichotomy between words, ordinary words, and terminology. There's a whole range of words which are gray areas in between. Yeah. And with larynx, for example, it's interesting that what you came up with was not really phraseology, but complex noun phrases. 
and a lot of these so-called terminological preferences are in fact complex noun phrases. Not only are many of the terms morphologically complex in themselves, but they enter into huge and very difficult, very complex noun phrases. But I think that's different from the sort of phraseology that Patrick is talking about, where he uses verbs, and it's uh, obvious why he uses verbs as an example. But there's a gray area. If I could mention cell again, cell is polysemous in a highly sensitive way. I don't think it is phraseology, or its phraseological potential is not great. What is great is its uh, possibility of entering into complex noun phrases. And I think that's different. <coughs> I think I saw a hand from someone who hasn't spoken. Yeah, Dirk Herratz. Um, just, just a brief comment about definitions in historical dictionaries. Uh, it would seem to me that the definitions that you make for a single reading have a, as one of their functions the function of explaining or implicitly explaining how that meaning relates to the other meanings of the same word. Because ultimately what you are describing is semantic change. It's, it's the evolution of a word. Would you agree that that influences the way in which you write um, definitions in historical dictionaries? And the consequence obviously is that uh, in a historical dictionary, <clears throat> even less so than in a synchronic uh, dictionary, it's in a sense not fair to evaluate a dictionary outside of the context of the specific entry. Would anyone like to respond yes, to that? I, I don't know, I don't know I, to I, whom this question is <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe we'd better take uh, Anna Davis on very brief. It seems to me that uh, it's fairly obvious that no definition will ever give all the senses of a word. That is not the case which needs to be made totally uh, at great length because it's true. But dictionaries have practical purposes among others. And so the question is, is it in any way legitimate or it is totally, totally, totally misleading to give a definition, to give an equivalence, to give a synonymous form and so on. And if I try, in my own experience, to find uh, something which might support doing this, apart from the practical use, which I think we all acknowledge, um, is the position of a bilingual, as in a sense I am, who has an automatic, without having been taught English, I never was really taught English, I have an automatic set of equivalences for practically every normal English words, words like cold, hot, beautiful, and so on. I know perfectly well that they don't, they are not correct equivalences. They don't, the match is very, very inferior. And of course, if I'm asked to discuss it, I will explain why it is inferior. But nevertheless, I have this automatic reaction to every English word and to every Italian word, I can move from one to the other. And so do, as far as I know, most bilinguals. They know what a word means in the other language. There is some reality some, in this, and that seems to me is in a sense something on which uh, the justification, both for bilingual dictionaries, which are equally absurd in some sense, and for the definitions in dictionaries, can rest. I'm afraid we must take that as a, as a, as a comment and, and, and draw to a close. Patrick Hanks has asked me to, yeah. to draw your attention to the handout that he's oh. uh, circulated earlier, a, a photocopy that's on the table. If you see on your, if you see on your table uh, spiders in the shower, um, this is an example of the kind of definition or dictionary entry, rather, that uh, I'm uh, arguing we might seek in a synchronic OED. I forgot to say that at the end of my talk. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, now, a quick uh, a business uh, announcement. Just to reiterate, we're going to have a, a very quick, if I can be in delicate uh, comfort break, and time to pick up a cup of coffee and then bring it back in here, um, because we're going to try and resume for our, our final plenary session in about five minutes' time, uh, when the respondents from all of the parallel sessions, including again as Lelenka, are going to come together and give uh, a very short presentation on some themes they've drawn from the uh, sessions that, that they've been responding to during the day.
Um, so it now remains for me to uh, thank again all of our speakers and our respondents for a, a very, very stimulating and, and entertaining session uh, later on in a, a very long, very full, but extremely stimulating day. Thank you very much.